Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, vote, vote counting begins after millions of Angolans head out in the most competitive election the country has had since 1992. The opposition rebel group turned political party UNITA hopes to unseat the MPLA, which has ruled for nearly five decades. But despite gains anticipated for UNITA, it and other opposition parties into which it has entered an electoral pact headed into voting day with concerns about irregularities in the process. We hear from our correspondents on the ground. And this week, the euro slumped to a 19-year low against the dollar. That has consequences for the many African countries still using the CFA franc, which is pegged to the European currency. But first, ballots are being counted in Angola after polls closed in elections that will deliver the country's next president. It's the most competitive vote in the country's democratic history, with the opposition UNITA party and its leader, Adalberto Costa Jr., coming closer than ever to rivaling President João Lourenço's ruling MPLA. It's not sure when results will be in, but early concerns about vote rigging saw some voters playing their part in trying to monitor polls. Clément Bonnero sent us this report. Vote and sit down. This is the name of a campaign launched by the Angolan opposition to monitor the vote. After casting their ballots, some voters chose to stay behind, but the response wasn't quite as big as some were hoping. We're here in our polling station. We're part of the Vote Sit Down campaign. The aim is to monitor the vote because we noticed that during the organization of the electoral process, there was a lack of transparency on the part of the Electoral Commission. So the lack of transparency, the lack of fairness in the organization of the electoral process means that we're here to monitor the vote. These voters were responding to a call from opposition party UNITA, which could be making history in today's vote. The party's candidate, Aldoberto Costa Jr., is running against incumbent president Joao Lorenzo, who is seeking a second term. Lorenzo hails from the MPLA party, which has held power for 47 years, ever since the country gained independence from Portugal in 1975. The MPLA has deployed 53,000 representatives to monitor the vote. There are also concerns within civil society about the transparency of the electoral process. A group called Mudai has called on voters to stay until the results are published in each voting station. We're waiting for them to put up the vote counts of this polling station. Then we'll take a picture of it and share the picture with whoever is interested in having it. The idea is to do that here, then go to other polling stations in the neighborhoods to take as many pictures of the results as possible. Some 2,000 international observers are also in Angola to monitor the vote. Official results are not expected for several days. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by Paula Cristina Rock, author and analyst specializing in Angola. Paula, thanks so much for speaking to us. Now, first of all, do you think that all of these concerns about the transparency of the vote are merited? I do. I think elections in Angola have been structurally manipulated to ensure the MPLA stays in power. Now, the MPLA controls the state machinery, it controls the electoral commission, the state media, it has overwhelming resources, uh, it controls the courts, uh, and it's also recently added uh, several uh, layers that make the process less transparent and, in fact, more opaque. So, counting, for example, the tallying of results have bypassed very important accountability steps, which which are counting the results at municipal and provincial levels. Now they're only going to be counted in Luanda, in the capital. And the civil society and the opposition don't really have access uh, to this counting process, um, which in, in a way allows the MPLA to determine the results at once. But despite the, these concerns, the, in the run-up to, to Wednesday's election, uh, it was reckoned to pose the toughest challenge yet to the MPLA's sway on power. What do you think is so different this time? Well, the, the difference is um, the opposition has created a very broad alliance uh, of other political forces, but also it's rallied the youth. Uh, UNITA has a new leader uh, that is... Uh, urban, that is younger, uh, that um, has more of a, uh, a sense of purpose and mission. 
And, um, and so he has uh, changed the image of UNITA and very much so the image that UNITA was portrayed uh, in the past, which was a movement that was rural and Africanist and, and almost backward um, and ethnically dominated. And the MPLA, in the contrast, was multicultural, multiracial, a modernist party. Now UNITA has shifted that entirely. And it's, uh, it's uh, rallying the urban youth. Uh, it's rallying, in fact, its leader is of mixed race. So this is very important because it's gone entirely in to a new phase of, of, of its own image. But it also adds to that the fact that poverty has deepened. There is widespread hunger in the country. People are disillusioned with the, the promises that uh, Jean Lorenzo made. Uh, employment has, unemployment has risen. And so the corruption uh, drive was a very much a political purge. So people are disillusioned and they want change. And so UNITA and the broad opposition uh, provides a, a, an avenue for that change. So the vote on Wednesday proceeded pretty peacefully. Um, and yet we saw this this massive deployment of security forces in the run up to it. Why so? Well, the MPLA has uh, also uh, strategically positioned the state funeral of the former president, uh, José Eduardo Santos, uh, to coincide with the, uh, the releasing of results. Now, there is big fear, uh, and because the elections have been so tense, that there will be protests once uh, the MPLA, uh, once the Electoral Commission starts announcing that the MPLA has won. The expectation is that the opposition will win. And so, um, you know, also this works very much to the psych psychology of the MPLA, which has always feared uh, an Angolan spring, which I don't think will happen. But the reality is that uh, they rather deploy a mass apparatus of the security forces and different security units to ensure that any protest will not get out of hand, won't uh, sky, um, won't go into a mass uh, social unrest situation that will overpower the mass security apparatus or it already has. Thank you so much for your insight, Paula. Christina Rock there speaking to us uh, on the day that Angolans head to the polls to choose their next president. Look now at some news in brief. In Ethiopia, in a blow to hopes for peace talks between warring sides, fighting between Tigrayan rebels and federal forces has broken out around the northern town of Kobo. It marks the end of a months-long ceasefire. Both sides say the other started the violence. Ethiopia's national security advisor claims the army shot down a plane carrying weapons to the region of Tigray. Meanwhile, Tigray and TPLF leaders say that that is a blatant lie. Thousands have been killed in the country since civil war first erupted in late 2020. In South Africa, about 1,000 workers marched on union buildings in Pretoria on Wednesday, calling on President Cyril Ramaphosa to do more to rein in rising prices. After the effects of the pandemic and the blow to the economy caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, inflation currently stands at 7.4%, with the frustrations of South Africans being deepened by ongoing rolling blackouts. Thousands of people have been trapped in South Sudan after 10 days of fighting around the town of Tongo. Many have been prevented from escaping by flooding that has cost at least 89 lives since May. It's not clear what may have triggered these latest clashes between rival militia. The battling undermines a 2018 peace deal meant to end more than six years of devastating civil war. Well, the euro slumped to a 16-year low against the dollar this week. That has consequences for the many African countries still using the CFA franc, which is pegged to the European currency. A weaker CFA franc means more expensive imports and trouble for households already facing rising food prices. Rosie Piot reports from Brazzaville. Pauline Malonga has run this small restaurant outside her house for 20 years. Now, because of the fall of the CFA franc against the dollar, she's struggling to adapt to rising imported food prices. Right now, the market is like a jungle. Now I'm retired, I can't even keep up. We chose not to increase our prices, but to serve smaller portions instead, so that people can still buy something to eat. If you increase your prices, customers stop coming. The Republic of Congo imports 75% of its food. These imports are paid for in foreign currency. As a result, many Congolese people are rushing to buy US dollars. And money changers like Zachary Oko are struggling to keep up with demand. Now the exchange rate on the informal market far exceeds the official rate of 650 francs to the dollar. 
In recent weeks, demand for the dollar has increased. We've been selling it at 690 francs per unit. Sometimes people come to buy dollars, but we can't give them any because we don't have them. Paul Obambi is the president of the Brazzaville Chamber of Commerce. He thinks that the fall of the CFA franc is not only bad news for the economy. A weaker currency makes Congo's exports, of which oil makes up the largest share, more competitive. He says the Congolese government should use those extra earnings to help support households. A certain number of operators. Many companies pay for their imports in US dollars and directly suffer the consequences of the fall of the CFA franc, which in turn pushes up prices. The government needs to speed up the implementation of measures to support the economy, including subsidies for basic goods to get prices under control. In April, the Congolese government announced the launch of a support package for people and businesses affected by rising global prices, but it is yet to implement it. While well, Tanzania is trying to boost the income and opportunities for small businesses and entrepreneurs, many of whom are women, by harnessing the ocean's bounty. The Ministry of Blue Economy is investing in training in conservation and marine environmental management to help Tanzanians who have more access to and make the most of the natural resources on their doorstep. <laughs> We plant when the water is high, and now the water is very full. You harvest as much as you can, and then go home. I'm thankful that my job gives me an income. I have four children who are studying at university, and I pay all their fees with what I earn. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again if you can. Till then, take care.